call this meeting to order at approximately 10.05 a.m. Lancaster Criminal Justice Commission, Wednesday the 11th, 2010. Call to order. Roll call. Commissioner Brown? Present. Fuller? Present. Gapel? Present. Greer? Present. Harris? Vice Chair Smith? Chairman Vieira? Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fuller, would you please lead us in the pledge today? Yes, please. Please stand and put your right hand over your heart. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Public business from the floor. Agendize items. This is the time for citizens who would like to address the Criminal Justice Commission on any agendized item. Please complete a speaker card and identify the agenda item you would like to discuss. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. Lyle Talbot. Good morning, gentlemen, ladies, Morning. audience. Uh, I made some comments regarding crime to the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors on June 1st, 2010, and I left a copy for each of you. I wrote this in haste and caught the turnip truck down to L.A. and presented it. It was about the Arizona boycott. In the May, I, I'll read it aloud. Tuesday, June 1st, 2010. <clears throat> there are plenty of opinions and suggestions slash solutions to the immigration problem. Witness the L.A. Times that morning I displayed five letters to the board. Until the federal government enforces its own laws, let me offer my suggestion. Instead of boycotting Arizona, who just might counter with reprisals, Los Angeles County and city could offer undocumented illegal immigrants a carrot instead of a stick by offering bona fide, quote, informants of criminal activity that they have knowledge of, a bit of security and relief from fear of deportation. A just reward without fear and just might be some sort of assistance in maintaining a green card status quietly and anonymously without fanfare and fear of revenge from the criminals who they help uncover. Not to rely on their word alone, but tips that can be verified by investigation and or prosecution. Sheriff Baca and Chief Beck just might see some merit in such a proposal, and the informant just might be instilled with a sense of modest pride for contributing to his adopted community. A bonus may come if it's encouraging others so inclined to help out if you publish the results and protect the sources, and then we'll have to wait and see who the first person to come forward. Thank you very much. And I got some applause in the audience for that. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't soliciting that. I still got 44 seconds. So I, I volunteered at the Sheriff's Department about 15 years out of the last 20. And uh, I've been at the... Uh, epicenter of what's happening now in Lancaster for quite some time, so. Okay. Uh, I didn't edit that. I uh, didn't, didn't have time for spell check. I just ran it through my old word processor. I don't have a computer. Thank you very much. Thank so, you. The city of Lancaster may, may be an innovation, and maybe uh, the Sheriff's Department would take a look at this, because that's what Chief Beck was complaining about, that there was they won't report a crime because they're afraid of uh, exposing themselves to illegals. Thank you. Thank you. Consent calendar approval of the minutes, July 14th, 2010. Uh, do I have a motion? Um, so moved. Any discussion, comments regarding the minutes? Oh, I, get a, I have a comment, sorry, in the minutes. 
on uh, the second page, uh, point seven, where it talks about the presentation made on CERT um, during the last meeting. The last sentence on that says that uh, Commissioner Fuller volunteered to bring CERT into the Neighborhood Watch Program. Um, one of the recommendations was that they be incorporated, uh, CERT be incorporated in Neighborhood Watch. Uh, but what I specifically volunteered for uh, was to represent the Criminal Justice Commission as a member of the Enlo Valley CERT Steering Committee. If we could have the minutes. I'll make the changes and bring them back for approval then at the next meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no vote at this time, correct, Brett? Okay. You can approve the minutes as they as amended if you'd like, or you can approve them when we come back in September. It's up to you how you'd like can to Can I proceed. change my motion then to approve them as amended? Sure. I'd like to do that. I'll second that. Waiting for one more vote. Waiting for your vote on the agenda. They're, they're waiting for your vote on the agenda. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commission staff presentations, updates, and reports. Monthly crime stats. Jim Cobalt. Thank you, Chairman Vieira. Um, let's see if technology catches up with us here. Okay, this report is for the time period from July 11, 2010 to August 7, 2010. That was where we left off with our la or at our last meeting. July, or July the uh, 10th was the last reporting day for the last meeting. This comprises four weeks. What we term week 29, 30, 31, and 32. Um, as you look at the numbers for violent crimes and property crimes, uh, in total part one crimes again you'll get over to the right side in week 32 and you'll see those numbers are a little bit low uh, those numbers are uh, probably somewhat incomplete because they don't contain the week afterwards that may have crimes that were committed in that previous week uh, things that were kind of interesting were week 29 and 30 you can see we kind of jumped up a little bit there and I that threw our forec forecast off as well um, you can see that the uh, that the uptick was was both in violent crimes and in uh, property crimes, so there's not really anything there to to uh, point at. One of the thing or one of the other things that's interesting is the uh, the uh, arrests for violent crimes and property crimes stayed relatively constant across that time period. Uh, the number of unique uh, report numbers uh, is across the bottom of the page. Um, and you can see that with regard to those, uh, they started spiking up and then dropped off a little bit, and then they kind of ended up in the mid-500s again. When we start looking at the weeks individually by reporting district, um, you can see that the uh, uh, 1132 was fairly consistent in there, as was 1137, 1135, and uh, um, 1121 popped up in the in the uh, 29th week, but uh, not in not so much in week 30, 31, and 32. However, we will see when we get to the to the uh, uh, overall counts that 1135 led the way with 37 uh, part one crime counts. Uh, 1132 and 37 followed in second place. Followed by or with 34, 1126 was in third with 30, then 1121 and 1127 um, had 25, and it's it's important to note 1120 or 1121 on there because um, 
1121 for the last couple of months had dropped off. It was right below, but but it's it's back up in there again. And then fifth place was uh, 1124 with uh, with uh, 22 Part One events. One of the things that I wanted to kind of touch on for you a little bit here was was some of the Part One activity and breaking it down just a little bit. And so what I did was I took a look at residential burglary and if we take a look at that we can see that uh, the reporting districts of 1137, 1132, 1121, 1131, 1135, and 1133 were the most active districts. If we take a look at those um, on the map I created a hotspot of residence burglaries, and you can see the area over on the uh, east side of town. Each one of 1131, uh, 1132, 1121, and 1133 are included in the uh, the highest density areas for uh, residential burglaries. And of course, this has been relatively consistent for a lot of our part ones across the board with these uh, with these areas. The thing that's interesting as we look at it, if you if you take a look at the one that's up here in 1132, uh, uh, school was not in session during that time period, so uh, we're I, I'm not sure of the level of significance of the of the schools that were there. But if we take a look, you can see that that we have a couple of city parks right in the uh, in the middle of that area. And again, I'm not sure about the relevance of that, but I do find it interesting to look at and see that, that the uh, parks are right in the center of, of uh, this particular activity up here. Now, 1121 seems to have some different characteristics, but it's not all that far away from, from uh, park area as well. So uh, these are some things to kind of look at. Now, one of the other things that I did was I also, let me zoom out just a little bit, I also took a look at uh, the arrests and where they were happening for residence burglary. And it's kind of interesting to overlay that with this because these are the hot spots of where the arrests occurred um, during that time period for residence burglary. And you can see uh, the, the focus is on 1121 because of the, uh, the area up in 1121's area, but also we have uh, uh, some activity over uh, near 1122. And if we zoom out and we go down here, uh, this was an area that was, that was uh, also being uh, hit for not only burglaries, but also larcenies. And the uh, the density of, of arrests for residential burglary down in this area between L or K and L, um, 20th to 40th, uh, also uh, helped out a lot. Well, what might be interesting as well, Jim, is that you know school went back in session this week, and when you look at that comparative data with that, with the forthcoming, it would be uh, telling possibly. Yeah, and the the other thing, the other variable that we'll have with this is. Uh, the uh, uh, the fair, which uh, again tends to be, at least from our looking at historical data, tends to to have an impact on it also. So we might not get really a good idea of school until September, uh, that because the fair will be over with then, and we can take a look at it. But hopefully the uh, the uh, truancy of or deputies that are out there can can uh, get on top of that before it gets out of hand. The next area that we moved, or, or that I took a look at was um, larcenies involving vehicles. And the reason why I picked out this was this is also a particular area of, of interest to the, to the uh, uh, detective unit. But in addition to that, as I took a look at the other larceny categories that are out there, um, now I, I actually took this from a time period that's a little off from the, from the measurement period that we're actually dealing with here primarily because I, I did this analysis last week in preparation for this meeting as opposed to to sitting and waiting for last week's data to come in. So everything kind of shifts back a week with it. 
but uh, the larcenies involving vehicles were probably the largest category of larcenies that we could really look at. Their, their category of, they had a, a, a larcenies, what they call larceny others, and that's really kind of a catch-all when they, when they don't have a, a classification, another larceny ca category to put it in. So those, there were 54 during this measurement period of July 4th to the 31st, but no clear patterns really kind of emerged from it. The other category that, that was significant was shoplifting and with 31 of those, but I have a tough time getting too shook up about the shopliftings because most of the time those come with arrests, and that means our defense mechanisms within the community, particularly within our commercial areas, are working well, and they are catching the people who are, who are involved in theft. So that's, that's not a, necessarily a bad number for us to carry. So the next logical area for us to look at was larcenies involving vehicles. And I, I counted nine during, or excuse me, 49 during this time period. And, and you can see again how the uh, frequency breaks down by reporting district uh, with 1132 leading the way, followed by 1126, 1121, and 1124. And then our, uh, our, our relatively consistent 1135 and 1137 follow behind it. Now this hot spot represents the uh, the uh, larcenies involving those autos, and you can kind of see again we're we're in this concentration area of of basically uh, between uh, 20th East and and uh, 20th Street West. Again, as the as the saying used to go, it's occurring between the 20s. Um, again, if you take a look at this dense area up here in 1132. We'll Again, we see right in the middle of it that that park again. So uh, again, I'm not sure what the what the relevance is of the park, um, but it's obviously at the at the center of these hotspots for both uh, the residential burglaries and for the uh, the larcenies involving autos. And the next area that I looked at was uh, uh, grand theft uh, of vehicles, and and basically the two st statistical codes that I looked at for the, or, or that I pulled data from from this is the uh, statistical codes 91 and 93 because those involve um, vehicle thefts, van thefts, and truck thefts, and there are actual thefts that we can track. They're not they're not like attempts or something like that. They, they're actually events that occurred. So those were of interest to me. A couple of things that I looked at within the scope of that was where were the vehicles stolen from? And the, the interesting thing to me was when you took a look at it, um, residential driveways led the way within the scope of, of uh, the vehicle theft. So parking your vehicle in your driveway she doesn't seem to be a big safety factor when you compare it to other um, other uh, factors. And then uh, residential streets followed that with followed by parking lots. And and I think when when we look at the data, and I know when I look at the data, sometimes the general assumption is uh, until you're proven wrong is that the thefts occur from parking lots because people can go out and and uh, mill through the parking lots kind of undetected. And this was really a surprise for me. I would have never guessed that, that residential driveways would have led the way, followed by public streets and then eventually um, parking lots. But that may also suggest that the Sheriff's Department has, has, has been effective in protecting those parking lots and the folks have, have gone somewhere else because we, we don't have the we haven't looked at the data any further back than this time period. Um, and then followed by apartment lots, uh, trailer park lots, residential alleyways, and auto sale lots. As we looked at the make of vehicles stolen, um, it, it was uh, uh, Hondas led the way with, uh, with five thefts, 
followed by Toyotas with four, Chevrolets with three, and then so on and so forth down into the to the single numbers uh, with regard to uh, uh, that group of vehicles that was stolen. Now the good news is 18 of those were recovered by the end of or, or by the time period that I, I looked at this last week. Um, seven of them had not been recovered and one had been repossessed. One of the things that I thought was interesting is um, of these uh, thefts, four, I believe, were recovered. Let me look here. Yeah. We, uh, I took a look at where the vehicles were actually recovered, and they were recovered. Uh, we recovered 11 here in Lancaster, uh, one in Palmdale, and four down in Los Angeles. And the interesting thing about the ones that were recovered down in Los Angeles, two of the four were stolen within about a block of each other. Makes you wonder if somebody was looking for uh, some transportation home. I'm sorry, what? Oh, yeah, let me see. That's okay. Now, we had one recovered down in Canyon Country and, and one that was recovered, but it didn't specify on there the, uh, where it was actually recovered at. That pretty much takes care of, uh, of that presentation. Um, as we, any, uh, before we move on, any, any questions on that? Yeah, I have a question. Maybe Lieutenant Downton can answer this. Um, as far as the parks, do we uh, normally in the past we've had uh, units assigned to the the parks during the summer? Are we still doing that? We uh, we've got deputies that are uh, dedicated to patrol the parks in the evening and uh, weekend hours. Yes. Okay. And also, uh, we we have a team in the LA County also that is assigned just primarily to parks. Is that correct? Yeah, but those are county parks, not city parks. So, yes, they do. They they take care of the the, the park in Courtsville, Apollo Park, and the parks in uh, Lake Los Angeles. Okay, so so they wouldn't be able to do the city parks at all. No. Okay, thank you. Yeah, bear in mind what 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 they're doing could be very effective. These are. These are events not necessarily occurring in the parks, but they're in the areas immediately surrounding the parks, which means if, if they're being effective, then the displacement could be affecting the neighborhoods in the, in the surrounding area. So these are kind of things that, that, that we need to take into consideration. Other questions? I've got one, Jim. Uh, you mentioned the, the uh, disproportionate number of uh, vehicle larcenies in a couple of the areas uh, that you mentioned. I want to say there was some concern the parks were nearby, and you didn't know if there was a definite correlation there, but there was some concern maybe there was. Are there, are there um, of those 49, I think it was 49, uh, vehicle larcenies, how many of those actually occurred at you know, the parking areas within the park? Uh, very few. In fact, I, I see if I can pull up the larcenies. Mr. Greer, as it relates to this issue too, is we're you know part of where we uh, we get a certain lapse sometimes out in the community. You know, as statistically as we go down, people become more complacent. Things we're constantly have to remind people is you know issues of making sure your vehicle's locked. Don't leave things in plain view in your vehicle that would entice opportunity type crime. Those type of issues that's related to this quite a bit. Some of this uh, you know we we've in the past had a high rate of this in certain parking lots and things where there's vehicles and people milling around out in that parking lot. So we want to train our folks through our neighborhood watch programs and, 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 and suggestions through here our public safety website and the Sheriff's Department for people to be diligent as they go out into those centers and, and they <coughs> observe certain behavior. And if people are in a, in a shopping center, they should be there to patronize the, the uh, businesses there and not mill about in the parking lot, those type of things. And if we see that activity, we need to address it. Well, one of the other uh, comments I had was I just wondered, do we have any data as far as, because um, I was surprised, too, that the number one place is the driveway to have your vehicle taken. Um, but how many of those were situations where keys were in the car? I just think that people tend to be more lax in their own driveway as far as leaving the car unlocked or maybe leaving the key in the car, one of the two. Um, so does that I, play I, any part in that? Nothing, nothing stood out immediately with that. Um, I, I was... 
I, I think I was so struck by the fact that the driveway played such a role that, that uh, and that's something good to look at. In fact, when we get done here this afternoon, I'm going to go back and take a look at that and see if if the keys actually played a uh, uh, played a role in it. If the keys, but then you get into to um, you know, there's no way to verify that. And of course, somebody I'm sure reporting it to their insurance company is not going to say the keys were in it. So. Right. I, I just wondered if some people do report that it was unlocked in the driveway or they forgot the keys. The, one of the things that I put up here were the, the events involving auto larcenies. And you can, you can see where they're at or where the events are relative to the parks. We have this park area up here, and this, these particular events you can see are, are within a, within a block or two or three of this particular park. See if I can see if I can label the parks for you so you can get an idea of what they are. This is the baseball and softball complex, and then this is the east side uh, park and pool. Um, and then we come down around this park, which is El Dorado Park. You can see in the proximity around it, uh, and it's right on the edge of that, of that heavy red area, the high density area. Then we come down to uh, Lancaster City Park, and of course, the 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 problem that we run into with Lancaster City Park is it also sits close to the to the uh, to the commercial area up at 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 Tenth and K, and then there are a lot of uh, of apartment complexes and within relatively close proximity as well. I think it makes you wonder also are those suspects from the neighborhoods where they're disappearing within those driveways and. Are they, in fact, potentially casing or familiar with habits of some of the residents? Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? I have a question. You, you were, when you talked about vehicle thefts, you said there was primarily Hondas that were being targeted in this case. Uh, looking at larcenies, I don't know if you looked at the same way, or is it mainly personal items being stolen from vehicles, car parts? What's the... You know, I, didn't, I didn't break it down that far in the study. I was just, I was primarily concerned with um, tying it to the, to, the, to the area to try to get a, a spatial um, idea of where it's happening and then what the characteristics were of the actual space where the vehicles were being stolen from. And that was... Um, uh, that was what was really going through my mind at the time that I was taking a look at this. Um, I, I'm sure probably these thefts involved whatever was laying out in the front seat or the back seat and was in plain sight, and that's probably what they went after. But that's that's not to say that the the the, the uh, Hondas and the Toyotas and and other vehicles those were in the vehicle thefts. Those were were not in the in the larceny category. Right. No, I understand. And, and generally, then you've got somebody that's looking for parts on a vehicle of that nature. I just know in the auto mall, we've recently had a, a few larcenies where tires and wheels have been stolen. Right. Is there more of that going on in the city? Or are we looking for people? Chop I didn't shots, look at that part but sales. I, but but I can consider that the next time and and let you know about that during the next meeting. No, thank you. Any other comments, questions from the commission? Thank you, Jim. Okay. Arrest stats, uh, Sergeant Kroger.
Okay, we're going to go through uh, basically the last uh, couple weeks of July. This is the breakdown we're going to do here. Okay, what we're looking at here is we're going to do our uh, part one activity for uh, the last uh, last two weeks of July, ending uh, the July 31st. Um, we had a uh, slight increase in our uh, part one arrest. Uh, we went uh, from 59 the prior two weeks to uh, 75 for this period of time. Um, our big increase for this period of time was in our burglary arrest, um, where we uh, logged uh, 30, 30 arrests for burglary in this two week time period. Uh, that was the most significant increase. Everything else pretty consistent. Uh, robberies, I believe, were up slightly. Uh, up to 17 from um, from uh, four from the previous time frame. So uh, part ones part ones up during this time frame. And this is going to display our uh, part two arrest for that same time period. Um, slightly down in our part two arrest. Uh, previous two weeks we were at 557, uh, down to 508. Uh, the uh, big difference in this, uh, this category was our narcotics related arrests, which were down slightly during this period. Uh, everything else is uh, fairly consistent with what it has been in the past. This will show a comparison with uh, some similar stations of uh, size and uh, cities of uh, comparable size and population. Uh, compare our part one uh, crime arrest and part two crime arrest to these uh, specific areas. Um, as you can see, uh, the uh, Palmdale station made slightly more part one crime arrest than we did during this period. Uh, that was the only uh, station that uh, that uh, beat us in the part one crime arrest and uh, Century Station was the uh, only one higher than us in the part two category. Uh, but we were significantly higher than, uh, than the, the rest in both part one and part two crimes during that period. Uh, these two graphs here are going to show uh, our year to date. Uh, the uh, green bar represents the previous year and the uh, red bar going across represents this year. Um, as you can see, the top, the top graph is our uh, part one crime data. Um, we are uh, significantly uh, higher during this month of July than we were the same time last year. Arrests have gone up from uh, we had uh, 99 last year went to 134 this year, so a pretty uh, big increase for this period of time. Um, and we've been been relatively stable in the part one uh, crime area. We've actually gone up. It looks like we in, increased uh, February, March area, uh, pretty consistent April, May, June, and then a, a little spike in July for our arrest. Um, part twos, we've uh, been consistently a little bit lower all year long. Um, it's not, not too awfully bad, uh, just a, a, a minor difference all the way across the year. Uh, and then we come into, uh, come into uh, July and we've just got a slight increase uh, by about three arrests from where we were the same time period, same time period last year. And I think that is it. And that's all I have. Any questions? Anything in particular that you attribute the increase in the part one, whether the arrest because you're more active, more crimes? What, what do you tie that to? Well, I think we've had uh, we've had some some operations that have been going on up here. A lot of uh, the ABCFI operations that have been going on. Um, the uh, our special teams are out doing doing their thing. Uh, it's just just a lot of just a lot of activity on the uh, the part of the, the special teams and special operations that have been going on up here, 
and that's been the focus of those operations is to target the part one crimes and it's been fairly successful thank you anything else thank you thank you, thank you. Hey, from the California Highway Patrol update, CHP Captain Hoos. Yes, we have uh, our stats are relative to the Antelope Valley area, so it's Palmdale, Lancaster, and all the surrounding communities, around 1,400 square miles. Um, July was actually a particularly good month for us, um, certainly not for the one individual who died in a collision, but year to date, uh, our collisions are down 61% for fatal collisions. We're having a, a particularly good year. Uh, we're fortunate there's a lot of different things we're doing. Uh, primarily, we're focusing on seat belts. Seat belts are, is a commonality, something we run into very consistently with fatal collisions. They're carefully hanging in their bracket instead of strapped around an individual. So our, our seat belt citations are up uh, it, just even in July by 50%, the uh, citations we're issuing. Our uh, fatal collisions, as I said, for the, the year are down 61%. Uh, overall collisions are down around 6%, which is helpful. I mean, normally in the Antelope Valley, we work around 100 um, collisions a month, actual formal investigations, investigated collisions, and last month we had 60, which was nice. Our drunk driving arrests are down a little bit. They were down... Um, Pretty significantly in July, 36%. For the year, we're down about 7%. But as part of that, our DUI-related collisions are down uh, 41% for the month and 15% for the year. So we're uh, having a banner year, actually. We're, we're doing well. I'm sure it's the, the Sheriff's Department and the Highway Patrol and public education playing a very active role in it. But the Antelope Valley area is doing very well. One thing... We're doing a little bit different this year and, and partially last year is with our uh, citations, we're issuing more of a citation that's uh, rather than criminal, there's, it's called a CHP 281. It's what some of the old timers used to call a, a Mickey. And all it is, it's a citation that we track only locally in our office and it's for any, any issue of um, a fix-it ticket something that doesn't have to clog up the court system, doesn't have to create a, a good deal of processing. The individuals fix it, put a stamp on it, and send it back to us. Or they can come in and have it checked off. But there's no cost associated with it. And our citations are down a little bit, and we are encouraging because of the economy of not just the Antelope Valley, but I think throughout the nation, uh, the use of this citation. And our, our 281s, these tickets are up 240%. So instead of last year where we issued uh, 226, this year we issued over 700 so far. So it, it's a nice tool. I mean, our goal is, is safety. It's not generation of revenue, contrary to some of the uh, opinions of, that I've been watching on television with Meg. But um, not to be involved in politics, uh, the Antelope Valley is going very well. Our partnership with you, our partnership with the Sheriff's Department, and, and every aspect of our criminal justice system is excellent. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the, the update, and those are some significant numbers. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Uh, in Commissioner Harris's absence, there will be no report on the Neighborhood Impact Program. Um, Business Watch Subcommittee, uh, before I turn it over to any other commissioners or, or Mr. Drieco, I'd have to say we had had the opportunity to go out to Target as one of the, our first stores to take a look at with regards to their loss prevention. And uh, I don't think I'll ever go into a Target again and feel the same. It was, it was impressive. It was informative. It was enlightening to see what they do at least that location, not familiar with others, with regards to uh, preventing crime in that store. So we had the opportunity, again, to spend probably close to an hour there with their manager looking through their security system, the uh, methods that they use to uh, uh, prevent loss, to, to uh, arrest, hold on to, and how they really work with the Sheriff's Department as well. It was good and look forward to doing more here with some of the other businesses in the city of Lancaster. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Greer and also Commissioner uh, Smith was with us, but is absent today. 
Well, uh, my comments would be the same as yours. It was interesting to see their approach um, and the, uh, the manager, for lack of, I don't remember his exact title, but the, the, the gentleman that was in charge of the security was very informative. Um, I, I didn't realize how many cameras there are in those stores until you start looking around when you go through the system with them. Uh, it was like a little mini casino when we went up into the, the, uh, the operations room where you saw all the different angles and perspectives they have to follow customers to the store. Um, it, it will be interesting to see when we talk with some of the other large retailers what their approach is, especially given the concern that, that has been brought to the Commission over a couple of large retailers uh, that don't seem to be very proactive or active at all. Um, one of the, con the, the um, comment that concerned me the most that the, uh, the gentleman in charge of security made was that he visits all, a lot of the stores. He works through San Fernando Valley and other areas, including Valencia, and he said that the amount of activity in his store that uh, he has to either get involved in for apprehension or the volume of stuff stolen was noticeably different in the Antelope Valley versus uh, Valencia. He said, Valencia, you almost went to sleep down there. So um, I think that's interesting uh, that they see that much of a difference that it's really noticeable. As I would think the demographic of the person who shops in the store stays relatively the same. Um, so those were my comments. Thank you. Mr. Jerico? Yeah, I will say that it, that was the gentleman's name was Matt Hernandez. Matt is the regional loss prevention manager for Target. Um, we picked Target initially because it was at the suggestion of Lieutenant Doughton and the Sheriff's Department regarding what the Sheriff's Department's observations were as far as their techniques and, and how effective they were for loss prevention there. Um, yeah, it was extreme. <laughs> it was more than I expected. They have actually uh, got it down to a science, even as far as aisle placement, mm -hmm. offsets, height of merchandise, things that they have done there, some different electronic attachment issues. And then the other thing I think that impressed me as well is they, they felt a responsibility for the immediate adjacent businesses and the parking area and things to create a safe environment for, for their patrons. I mean, even in PM shift, they even have, uh, what are those two-wheel things called? They have a security person in the parking lot, yes, in, in the evening. Um, and so they're very proactive in that direction. So I think statistically, I, I liked what they did, too. They had a certain threshold where they did not involve the resources of uh, the community as far as the Sheriff's Department and law enforcement based on a certain threshold amount in dealing with a certain age group, where they worked in a cooperative relationship with the parents and those type of things. So I think they're pretty innovative. I, I think for, for myself and, and for the commissioners as well as we take – uh, visits to other locations. We're going to take some things that they've presented and may, may very well see some other things that other um, retail vendors are doing that are good. And then, and then, they Target is very interested in working in, a, in collaboration with those other retail outlets to uh, work collectively together to resolve some of these issues that they're having. So I thought it was very positive. I'm now. Um, going to discuss with uh, Chairman Vieira our next location, and it's something I'd like to schedule in the next couple weeks based on your schedules, and again, meet with their regional loss prevention person as well, so we're talking to the person that's in charge of that issue at each one of these retailers. Look forward to it. Again, just the, the I guess, the importance they place on detail. When you go into a target now and you look at their, the wide aisles, you won't see things on the floor. And they actually, what they do is they make sure that that happens. So if something is missing, they have a better, you know, better idea of what it may be. They also train their staff to go up and ask somebody, "Can I help you? What are you looking for?" As they believe that also prevents that individual from taking something at that time, and maybe they'll move on. So uh, they got a, they're a good model, I think, to, to follow. So anyway, thank you. Public business from the floor, non-agendized. We request any person who would like to address the Criminal Justice Commission on non-agendized matters to complete a speaker card. You will find speaker cards on the back, back table of the council chambers. Additionally, we respectfully request that you fill the cards out completely and print as clearly as possible so that, if necessary, the commission or city staff will be able to contact you either by phone or mail. 
Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. When you approach the podium, please notice there are three lights. The green light comes on when you begin. The yellow light will come on when you have 30 seconds remaining. And the red light will come on when your three minutes are up. We ask that you be considerate of the allotted time to allow other speakers to have their three minutes. Following this procedure will allow for a smooth and timely process for the commission meeting, and we appreciate your cooperation. Michelle Egberts. Good morning. Good morning. I know I've talked to a numerous amount of you on the commission. You have to deal with the ex-offender population that's coming back into Lancaster. They're coming home. It's youth as well as adults. Each one of you have an effective spot on that commission to address this issue. However, you've been avoiding it with me. Now, I can understand why you would avoid it with me because you're curious, why would I do this? Well, I care about this community. I do. I made a mistake. I went to prison. I spent two years and two months on a fire crew. And I enjoyed it. I learned something new. However, when we come out, you know, there's a dearth of resources available to us here. I did a gap assessment, which I did systemic population and location. There is minute resources here for ex-offenders. And you're talking about youth as well as adult. Now, when they transition back into the community, you know, this, we want to see success to discharge. And each one of you can help. We have one with housing here. We have Agent Gapel, who's an effective agent with CDCR. You with education. Tim with automotive. And Dr. Brown, you know how many people come over there to AV Hospital. You know, we have to address this all. You know, I can't, I mean, when you talk about crime and everything, why not talk to an ex-offender? How do they steal? How do they shoplift? How do they get into those cars and our driveways? Talk to an ex-offender. They can help you. There's nothing wrong with an ex-offender combining, you know, collaborating with law enforcement. We can work effectively together. Mr. Vieira, I sent you a long email. I, you know, yeah. <laughs> And the, the ex-offenders can address the juvenile population that we have in our truancy division. You know, we can address those burglaries that's over there in the weed and seed area. We can work effectively together. Now, I, I do not doubt for one moment that you're skeptical in dealing with me because of my past conviction. However, actions speak louder than words. Give me a chance. That's all I'm saying is give me a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, a couple questions. Um, the program that you're proposing uh, for resources for people that are released from prison, and how do these res in other words, how do these resources differ from the resources that might have been available for people before they went to prison? Well, there, there's a big difference, okay? Number one, the state of California hasn't been in budget for over 20 years, which the nonprofit organizations are deeply hurt financially, okay? So they, they don't necessarily have the, the resources to help. They can refer out, all right? The city of Lancaster uses air funds for housing, you know, the HPRP program. However, um, air gives them the flexibility to deal with the criminal history, and they elect the city of Lancaster elects not to deal with someone with a criminal history to help them out. And the other service providers that are out there, I mean, they're they're flapping in the wind. That's why if we put together a reentry task force, it will put us in a, a very good eligibility position for federal funding to help the ex offenders. It seems to me there's sort of two issues. One if a kid's graduating from high school, what resources are available to him to make sure that he becomes integrated into a, as a productive member of society? Well, there's there's a lot of grants available to an individual that graduates from high school. M most people, I think my point is that most people graduate from high school, for example, or get out of community college and mm -hmm. find a job and go to work. Right. How does a... People, how do the people coming out of prison differ from that group? Well, because of the fact that they have a felony conviction. 
All right. That's, and therefore, that's, it's harder for them to it, find it a is, job? It is harder for them. It is. You know, you, you mark that box saying, I have a felony conviction, and, you know, they're, they're willing to deter it. That's why I, I recently went on AV3 with Russ Williams. Stop crime, hire a felon, nothing stops a bullet like a job. To bring the awareness to the community that these guys are coming out, men and women, are coming out with viable skills. Okay? There are benefits to hiring an ex-offender. However, the problem lies in, in when an ex-offender comes out, he goes to the parole office, they're at a PAC meeting and everything, they're not provided with the information about the work opportunity tax credit, you know, which is $2,400 for an ex-offender. They're not aware of the enterprise zone in the city of Lancaster and Palmdale. 30, on $8 an hour, that's $37,500 over five years for a, an employer to hire an ex-offender. You know, I talked to Robert Troutman, over at the CEO of Lancaster Hospital. We were on the same time with Russ. And he wants the ex-offenders, you know, however there's a criteria that has to be met, because he wants the tax credits. You know, there are benefits to hiring these guys. These guys are coming out with viable skills. That's why, you know, I had the idea of when I partnered, when I collaborated with, with um, Ranco Construction Group, to bring a construction company just for ex-offenders so that the ex-offenders can make, you know, wages to live on and also to pay their victims. You have to look at the side, too. There are victims out there that have restitution coming. And until they're paid that restitution, they're going to continue being victimized. In their mind, and that's true. Therefore, you know, by putting together this reentry task force, which CDCR has a task force in place themselves. The city needs to have a reentry task force. The way that I plan this out, we can reduce in five years the recidivism right here by 50%. That's a pretty good figure, not 2020. And all I want to do is talk to you about it. The second part of, of what you seem to be suggesting is that there's uh, uh, some sort of federal government funds that, and uh, in their wisdom, they're looking for government, uh, state and local governments, to give away taxpayer money to, since they're going to be giving it away to other uh, state and local mm -hmm. uh, groups, uh, that the city of Lancaster may be missing an opportunity to get an allocation point. of federal funds. Right. You're looking at JAG funds. You're looking at um, Second Chance Act funds. $14.7 million is what I found that we're eligible for. However, some of them are demonstration grants. And in order to be eligible for that, you have to have a reentry task force in place. The city of Lancaster, I mean, we have everything here. We have a parole agency. We have probation here. We have a courthouse here. I mean, we have a sheriff's department right here. And we can partner with the city of Palmdale, which would make us twice as, you know, eligible for those funds to partner up. So if, if you had the opportunity to put together some documentation that would be easy to understand and that would reflect a easy pathway for uh, our local community to uh, obtain uh, what would amount to, from our community's point of view, free money from government exactly. uh, for a program, I'd be interested in seeing that. Thank you. I don't want the city's checkbook. I have said that from the beginning last September. You know, the city of Lancaster is in a unique position, too, because we're an all-American city. We're eligible for that grant as well, applying for it. We, and like I said, you know, we have to address the ex-offenders and, and the recidivism rate because it is a public safety issue. This is my community. This is the community that I offended. And I'm trying to make amends with it by coming out and utilizing my experience, seeing the $7.3 billion that we put into CDC to become CDCR in 2007. I think we want, would like to see a return as taxpayers on our investment. I don't see another parolee here. And you're not going to. I mean, they're afraid of law enforcement, number one. However, they can work effectively together. That's why I said in my email to Dave, Mr. Vera, go to a PAC meeting. Mix and mingle with the ex-offenders that are coming back home. 
see what their needs are. Just for clarification, so at this time, are you saying that there's no type of program that offers these types of things that would be would make it redundant? No, there's no, a, there's is, no is, type of program like this. There is they have Lancaster has a, a new nonprofit agency. It's called Paving the Way, and that's with Janie Hodge. And then you have Grace Resource Center and everything. Now, Paving the Way, Janie is, is incorporating the Antelope Valley Reentry Coalition. She's incorporating the reentry workshop over at the, the parole office and everything. Now, that's redundant because they get that inside as far as, as, far as the reentry, the pre-release program. A reentry workshop, I mean, they need to partner with employers. You know, they have to find this felon-friendly employers. Because you know that well, you know this, and when you when you're applying for grants, and if you're in competition with many other numbers, then you really decrease the chances of getting that grant. So, is this putting you or others in this type of a circumstance? No, I mean the the demonstration grants. As far as um, I talked to Dr. Uh, Gary Dennis, he's a senior policy advisor for um, the Bureau of Justice and everything. The demonstration grants, you know, I mean, he oversees that, and he's a very good friend of Matthew Cates because he's over correction side. Um, there isn't a lot of application for it mm -hmm. because they're not aware of it yet. It's new. The Second Chance Act grant came out of 2007 State of the Union address from Bush, mm -hmm. you know. America is the land of, of opportunity and Second Chance. That's how Second Chance Act came about. Is there a timeline with this? Pardon? Is there a timeline associated with this grant? Well, yes. For, for next year's eligibility, the cutoff is, is March for the application. And so that's why we're in a very good position right now to, you know, to let's bring reentry on the table. Let's bring in the service providers, see what their needs are, do a needs assessment on them. You know, these are, these are community members here. Mm -hmm. You know, see what their needs are, see how we can address the, the individuals coming back out and and getting them to be taxpaying citizens you know that's all I'm saying you know it's it's good enough to investigate mm -hmm. and you know uh, the key stakeholders I, I went A to Z the key, key stakeholders here in the community mm -hmm. and each one of you are on it and that's why I say this commission is an effective commission you have to reach out to us too I'm trying to reach out to you which I understand, you know, there's going to be skepticism. You're going to have, you know, you're going to have those, I, I, you're going to have curiosity. That's why we're here asking and listening. Uh -huh. There's nothing I want from you except from, for your time and your attention and, and to listen, your ear. I want you to hear what I have to say. And, and how we can go about this. I don't want to be here out in the, in the limelight. I would like to be in the back, you know, supporting it and pushing it through. And believe me, I've done a lot of damage control from what happened to me, you know, from, from what I did. Okay. You Other know? questions from commissioners? Oh, comments? Yeah, I'd like to interject here. Sure. Um, as, as far as any dealings with Ms. Green, she is on active parole as NRP. Mm -hmm. And I am recusing myself of having anything to do with her due to the fact it would be a conflict of interest. Um, I think that it would be in the best interest if Ms. Michelle Green would it's tell... Egbert's not Green anymore. Egbert's Green. <laughs> it, would, it would be in the best interest if everybody knew what your criminal history was. Exactly. Exactly. My history is grand theft. Okay? And Pick who are head. your victims? Pardon? And who are your victims? I had five victims. <sighs> One, one of my victims was with the Sheriff's Department, and he was a very good friend. Was he a volunteer? Yes, he was, and he was 77 years old. Were all your victims elderly? No. No. Were all, they, were all of them volunteers? Pardon? Were all of them volunteers? No, just Bella. Just Bella. He, had, he was with the Sheriff's Department. So as you can see, in the, if she's in the background, we, as I know where I, where I work, we, we promote volunteerism. I cannot work with you if you're going to jeopardize any type of tarnishment of the commission or the parole department. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like I had that meeting with you, and 
your supervisor, you know. And Jeff she told Fraser. you and she told you also that it was a conflict of interest. It's not it's not a conflict. That's what you don't understand, Agent Capel, and that's why I tried to get through to you. When you sit on that commission, you sit on there as as an individual. You do not sit on there as a, in a parole agent capacity. There's no conflict of interest between the two of us when you sit in that seat. Yes, there's there not. Is. Yes, there is. You see it as conflict of interest, but there's not. My department sees it, and I see it, and I will If not, you go through policy and procedure, Agent Capel, you know, policy and procedure sta states, what happens when you, when you sit on a commission? Any other questions or comments from the commission? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Who's speaking? Over here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm down here. Yeah. I just want to clarify one thing on our reentry programs. We do have reentry programs that we're, we, we have developed and we're currently developing for NRP. Uh, it is run through our Weed and Seed Grant and Paving the Way. They are not redundant. Uh, and we've been extremely successful. We had one, our last class graduated, and four of those people currently have jobs now. So we do have things in place that are extremely successful. Um, honestly, she's got a lot of good information, and she's got some good experience. And I think that we can use some of that information and experience, but we've discussed, and I've discussed with her personally, that because of some credibility issues that she she can support us with information but she can't be on the foreground in any type or any any capacity where she's an advisor so that would be my recommendation thank you very much A commission. We have one more speaker card. I'm I wanted sorry. to confirm you were done with that item. <laughs> David Aber. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and commissioners, uh, staff, and uh, citizens. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but uh, Mr. DeRico sparked my interest. He made a comment a little earlier with respect to the parking lots and, uh, you know, keeping those a safe place, I think, is the uh, direction he was going in. I'm, I'm all for that. I'm over there by the 24-hour uh, fitness gym. And uh, I'm sure you in town are familiar with the lady that's there every day. She's been exposing herself. And uh, you've got others out there. You've got a guy that... Uh, Pretty big guy that seems a little dangerous, and I'm sure that the uh, lieutenant over there can uh, take note of this. Um, I walk my dog around that building in the morning and sometimes in the evening, and especially in the morning, you got a lot of the panhandlers and got a lot of activity out in those parking lot areas, especially at 24 hour fitness. I'm sure it's one of the busiest places in our town. I, I think they're averaging between 1,000 to 3,000 per day over there. So, um, you know, if somebody could look into that, I'd really appreciate it. Um, the other day, um, I came home from walking the dog, and as I came around the corner at about a quarter to eight, I uh, had the motorcycle cop coming around the corner with his lights and siren on. Caught my attention, and uh, actually, before he came around the corner, there was a lady coming around my corner about 40 miles an hour plus, which is awful fast. And uh, almost, you know, mowed me down, and there's, there's kids on my street. It's a pretty nice street over there. And they... Uh, caught up with her. She zoomed in the driveway. I thought he was going to pull his gun on her. I mean, it looked, you know, he was pretty much in pursuit. And my point being, um, I sat there and watched the procedure go down. They ended up towing her car. She was driving on a suspended. Uh, from what I could tell, she was driving on a suspended with her drunk driving. And uh, another officer showed up, which would have been Officer Wells. It was Wells and Burke, because I spoke to him after the fact. And... Uh, they found an open container at a quarter day on this drunk driving, and yet they didn't arrest her, which really uh, kind of upset me. I, I guess they can use their discretion, but, uh, you know, when you find an open container with someone on suspended and uh, under, under this situation, uh, and uh, Burke was the uh, original officer. I thought he did a pretty good job, but Wells had a, kind of an attitude when I questioned them 
down at the corner later, how come they didn't uh, arrest this lady, who, I mean, like I said, I mean, she about ran me down, and the dog and, and the kids. But, uh, you know, like, and, and, and for what it's worth, um, I do appreciate, um, I mentioned to the same officers maybe four or five months ago, all the activity in that parking area with the illegal turns and so forth, and they patrol that regularly. So I didn't have to come here and talk to anybody else. The actual motorcycle officers themselves uh, picked up the ball and uh, said, hey, we got someone letting us know. And I mean, it's free money. They got that illegal U-turn coming out of McDonald's every day. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Commissioner, comments? Any comments from commissioners today? Start anywhere? If I just I see the cert is on there as well. I uh, just wanted to mention a couple of things. And, but um, since we had our meeting last month, there has not been an Animal Valley Cert Steering Committee meeting, so I haven't been had a chance to uh, meet with them yet. But there will be one this this coming month in September. And uh, what I intend to do at that meeting is then discuss the results of our commission meeting last month and uh, the interest of integration of uh, start with the neighborhood watch, pro watch program and then ask for their suggestions on how to go about doing that. So that's what I see as the next actions on behalf of the commission. Okay. That, that's all. Other comments? Yeah, I wanted to uh, um, commend the uh, Sheriff's Department on the, uh, as everybody knows, we're in the media quite a bit uh, from the operation yesterday. I wanted to commend the, uh, the Sheriff's Department on, on a great operation and the, uh, the task force. And maybe Lieutenant Downton can tell us the uh, the impact of, to our community because of this and the uh, the overall operation, the background of it? Sure. If you haven't read the papers, we had a great big operation that involved over 400 officers yesterday. Um, it was part of our um, uh, targeted gang enforcement in the Antelope Valley, and it involved a gang that uh, uh, affected both cities. Uh, both Palmdale and Lancaster. Uh, it's a, a federal and state indictment case. Uh, they served uh, warrants at 62 locations, and they've arrested 44 people, um, most of which will be indicted through the, uh, the federal court system. So very, very successful. It, it sends a clear message to the entire community that... Uh, you know, we're going to stand up, and we're we're not going to stand for uh, any gang violence in our community. Uh, it's important to note that this this gang that we went after, and we've you know it's been a year long task force, that uh, they were involved in uh, the shooting of a deputy down in Palmdale. He survived the shooting. In fact, he was part of the operation. But uh, we are just not going to take gang violence in our community. Thank you, Lieutenant. Any other comments? Seeing none, we stand adjourned at 11.15, and we'll be back on Wednesday, the 8th of September. Thank you very much.